So uh, instead of an introduction with a, a resume, I, I kind of want to hear a little bit more about why you do what you do. So um, we'll start. Nolan is right to my left, and we'll go around the circle. For those who are <coughs> panelists, uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us about what you do? Uh, my name is Nolan Maurice. Uh, I work with an organization called Line Break Media. We're a profitably owned uh, like kind of communications house. We do um, a lot of video work. We also do a lot of uh, um, like other kind of work we focus on storytelling and using that for uh, mainly like pseudo political purposes. Um, I got into the work. I hadn't even picked up a video camera before we started doing it. Um, but um, I got into the work because I wanted to. Um, Support the communities that I cared about, the communities that the most inspired. Um, I've had lots of conversations with folks around um, what would be most useful in their work. And the, the two themes that were coming up at the time were like narrative, storytelling, and then the other was the term new media, which we kind of distilled out to being mainly video. Um, but we're still looking back at that and trying to see what's going to be most effective for our partners. We got, we got people coming in, for everybody that's coming in, um, we have panelists throughout the circle, we, we switched this up a little bit and made it a little different. Um, the panelists are introducing themselves now and talking about uh, why, why they may be, it doesn't have to be a perfect circle, you can like this. It could be kind of raggedy, but it's cool. Um, so, so Michael would be next. My name is Mike Fisher. Um, I've been out here in Minneapolis for the last five years. Um, I'm originally from California. Um, I'm also a filmmaker, photographer, musician, and uh, um, filmmaker. Um, but I um, originally kind of got into doing this because you know I just kind of wanted to um, have a creative outlet other than music. Um, and I was kind of inspired by like music videos and stuff that I've seen. So I started out doing music videos, and then um, doing that, I kind of just you know got. You know, I was seeing you know the same kind of narrative you know happening around me through music videos. You know, it's the same kind of everyone swagging out doing whatever, and I'm like, you know, I don't really want to be perpetuating the same narrative constantly. So I was like, I can't really identify with a lot of the stuff that's going on. So I want to create narratives that I can identify with personally, and also to you know create more Afro-centered you know narratives and, and whatnot um, in media and production and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Bianca Rhodes. I am a television producer and photographer. And I came into this because it's a part of my strong family legacy. Um, it just became a part of my life um, through my uncle Pete Rhodes. Um, and our family legacy is to change the narratives about black people, period. Um, I learned that very quickly <laughs> as, a, as a young person. And for me, um, it's changing the narrative about African American women um, and African American women in media, both in front of the camera and behind. Um, so that's kind of just been my purpose um, to tell the stories of us, um, the positive ones. Um, the ones that change the world. So that's just kind of where I come from. Dos, um, my name is Missy Whitman, and I'm from the Rapamoke Nations. I grew up here in the Twin Cities, but originally I'm from the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming and Kikku Nation of Oklahoma. Um, number one, I'm an artist. That's really the foundation of who I am as I'm an artist. Um, kind of put people put labels on me. I guess I'm a filmmaker, storyteller, visual storyteller. Um, also, um, you know, this is my life's purpose. That's really how I see it. And everything that's led me up to this point has really been um, not of my guidance, not of my my making. But I do listen. Um, and this is really just about a journey, and this is, you know, filmmaking is a way to tell about the journey, to tell about <coughs> people's journeys. I know, we're 
Destiny, I think you might be the next panelist. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Destiny Roberts. Um, I'm a filmmaker, uh, musician artist, whatever. Yeah. Um, I got into the filmmaking when I was 14. Originally, uh, uh, A1 athlete, I guess, uh, basketball, track, basketball, and um, softball. Um, I tore my ACL, which really was what got me into um, the arts more deeply, and actually that was like the best thing that could have happened to me. Um, and so I just, since I was 14, I've been making films. Um, my first piece was like a little documentary about the music, which was really close to me. Um, and so I guess I'm sorry to tell all you guys as well. Um, I try to make like conscious pieces. Um, my favorite piece I've made was actually like in high school. And it's called From the Roots, How Hair Ties to Culture. And it's just about like, it's, it's deep. It's, it goes there. It's like a kid study and all that. Um, and now, actually, I'll uh, introduce my boyfriend, Anthony. Um, he's from New York. We actually have a little a company together called Like Us, which is a big part of what I'm doing now. What he's doing. Um, we kind of collab together, put our gifts together to create like photo shoots and video shoots um, around the community or community. So it's kind of just showcase like the positive and entrepreneurial lifestyle, like as a couple, um, and our minds as a couple of creators. And so we just kind of do our thing, trying to change the world together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca McDonald, and I'm owner and director producer of Be Fresh Productions. I've been doing this work for about 10 years. I went half season on a camera with my dad many, many years ago. Um, I didn't really have an arts background. I was more into politics and organizing, so I kind of took my political organizing and bridged it out into journalism. So I started doing a lot of music photography for City Pages like 10 years ago, and did that for many years and was really interested in expanding my photography. So I started writing extended captions and then it turned into writing and I've been doing this for now officially as a business for a year. So Be Fresh Productions is an LLC. So I think my story is kind of interesting because I've taken myself as an artist, as a journalist, a community organizer, and kind of try to figure out how to make that into a business and make that sustainable. And um, my company is mostly into refreshing media, exploring culture, and connecting community. Those are our three, the three pillars. So any kind of projects that come through our door, we kind of filter and say, you know, is this something that we really want to do? Is this a story that we can make an impact with? So that's kind of where I'm at. Thank Great. You. And, and the reason we're in the surplus is I'm going to open it up very quickly for us to start talking. And I'll throw out individual questions so to keep it moving in the direction of, of you know, where we're trying to gather the information. And then we're going to have, at lunch, um, a shorts program that's going to highlight all of panelists work um, one by one so you get a chance to see all their work and I encourage you to get their website and really get into some of the, the dynamic storytelling that's been done. We don't have enough time to show it all but maybe perhaps that's something we need to talk about which is uh, exhibition distribution like how do we, we pull together some of these reasons. As, as you can tell all of the, the panelists that we have are of an independent nature. They're not necessarily affiliated with any um, structural sort of media making. They're all a lot of self-made, sort of self-organized, self-passion, motivated individuals who learn how to create, whether that was just about picking up a camera and doing it themselves or, you know, uh, apprenticing behind folks. So there are a lot of ways for us to, to gain this craft and to gain this technique. And so I want to open it up to um, the whole group and if you have a question just introduce yourself first that's all I ask um, but yeah let's let's chop it up let's talk if anybody want to ask specific questions about tools about techniques about some people's personal backstory 
we're kind of open. What, what we want to get out of this is a more well-rounded understanding of what the independent new media landscape is here in the Twin Cities, uh, particularly around film and video. Questions, thoughts? Everybody's shot. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so, infinite. What does collaboration look like? For Can you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. My name is Andrea um, Layman Ganser, and I am a media maker, mostly documentary. And um, I'm actually just getting back into it because I have two beautiful children that I've been focusing on for five years. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious about what collaboration looks like in the landscape. Yes. How do you get talent, or is it the talent all within their own organization? Anybody want to grab that question? Any of our panelists? Well, I know for me, um, reaching out to your own networks is a huge hit. Um, I produce, uh, over at WCCO, I produce Urban Perspective. And, um, once we had got the green light for everything, um, it really taught us how big our networks were. Um, our, my family's been in the media business for over 30 years, but we just never, it just, until you have to use it, <laughs> you're not really aware. And like, I was literally going through my Facebook friends and um, my uncle going through his business cards and emails and stuff, and so, I think the, a good start would actually be to reach out to your own networks first, because they also know people too, who know someone else, who know someone else. Um, and also going out and networking, um, like I, I just got <coughs> shooting Candy Fresh on Thursday, and I was like, man, this is great, but we need more women dancers. Like I had all these really dope dudes doing their own stuff. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> it was like, we need more. So then I went to the Overcoming Racism Conference, met a woman that said, I heard about your show. Someone told me I really needed to be there, but I couldn't make it. And, how, and she was like, and I'm a dancer. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so you never know um, how, you know, you always kind of meet people and also like check into your own networks. Hey, Bianca, can you tell us a little bit about like how Urban Perspectives is still like an independent production, yes. even though it has WC, uh, CCO as a, as a distribution, it's still like you all can hustle and to, to make, can you tell us a little bit about sort of yeah. how that works? So um, WCCO has two independent businesses that are within its facility. It's Encompass and Urban Mass Media Group, which is uh, Pete Rose um, <coughs> production facility and media group. Um, so CCO, we had to pitch to CCO. It wasn't something that was like, okay, you guys, here's an opportunity. No, we had to meet with the executives and pitch them an idea and pray to God that they would pick it up. <laughs> um, even though we were in, we're in their facility, but we're a very independent business. Um, so they are, in a way, our media sponsor. So. They are the crew. We can't touch none of the equipment. Um, if you've ever been on a union shoot, you can't even touch your mic. So, um, so once they agree, they are the ones that handle it. But again, we we're a <coughs> production house within WCCO's building, and there's only two of us. So, but yeah, you gotta pitch your idea. <laughs> Uh, Missy, can you talk a little bit about uh, the project you've been working on, and particularly talk about how how you get financing to do like independent passion projects? Yeah. I think a lot of people would be interested yeah. to hear. Well, I want to uh, first answer your question oh, yeah. about uh, collaboration, and uh, for a long time it, it's just been me um, until you get for hire work, and then that changes. But even then, um, as you move forward, it's uh, well, it's, this is my perspective. But as I move forward, I've had allies come along and be with, you know, with the work for years now. Um, you know, it's, it's growing, you know, it is growing, but um, that's the thing is like, you have to first understand how you work, you know, what your limitations are, what your boundaries are, 
before you can begin to bring other people on. Um, so the project right now that really we're, now we're expanding um, is called The Coyote Way Going Back Home. It's a short sci-fi film about a young boy named Charlie um, who has to make a decision whether or not he wants to join a gang. And it takes place here in Minneapolis and um, the really unique thing about it is that it is, there's no dialogue, <coughs> so there's only monologue. And the only monologue that's in it is in Plains American Indian Sign Language. Mm -hmm. So that's really something, you know, within my work, I bring, <coughs> let me back up. Okay, so for us traditionally, um, storytelling was a part of our, our ways. So we didn't have books, we didn't have the written language. Some people may say, like Ojibwe, uh, Selavix, Selavix and that's how you say it, is our written language, but actually was introduced to us through the churches. So, a little bit of history. Um, that's really important to know, because we relied on our stories. We relied on the stories to keep our traditions, to keep that knowledge, to keep that, keep that wisdom, and to also maintain our places in our societies. And so coming from this, this background where we're very much about societies, we're very much about age-graded societies, we're very much about e equality. You know, it's not, you know, men are in charge and that's it, or women are in charge, that's it. You know, if you go back to like my Kikpu people, we have our traditional teachings still intact, where we have a council of women, we have a council of women elders, we have a council of men and men elders, and then we have our runners, which go between these two councils, or these two clans. So that's something that I feel is really important as a Native filmmaker, is that I understand my history, and I understand my people's history, and I understand where I'm coming from, therefore I can begin to tell these stories. But if you're coming from a traditional belief of telling these stories, you first have to ask permission. So for us, traditionally, it's we ask permission, we ask for guidance, we ask for help to tell these stories. And so um, Nolan's been on shoots with me, he knows we, you know, we smudge and we pray and we ask for permission to tell these stories first. And so with this project, it's really, you know, is this the right project? Is going back home the right project for me? And is, it's been going on since 2011. And the people, like no one supported it for a long time, and there are people that have stuck by me and said, let's do this. So really, the collaborators are the community. The collaborators are my allies. It's not just a filmmaker here, a gapper here, you know, it's the people that support this project. So um, this story is not my story. It's actually, you know, to help, you know, talk about you know, gangs, native gangs, because right now I, I saw something in the city pages about Native gangs and banishment. I'm like, it's a huge issue. It's not just one article that's gonna lay it out for you. It's gonna, it's, it's a lot more. I mean, we didn't just banish people because they're in a gang, we banish people for a lot of different reasons. So um, that's where we're at with the funding. You know, it was really luck. It was, you know, I believe in threes. You know, I believe in threes. So if opportunities come to you three times, you take it on the third time. And for me that was um, moving to the next level, which is through the Sundance Native Lab. And so now I'm a Sundance Fellow, and that's something that is like any, any organization, right? They're like, we'll give you this label, we'll give you the stamp of approval, but it's still up to you to produce. It's still up to you to use this opportunity to move forward. Um, with that fellowship, um, opened another door with Jerome Foundation which is really, you know, how do we reach people of color? They're like, how do we reach communities of color? So well, first you have to change the way that you ask people to apply for your grants. Mm -hmm. You have to first change your approach to people who are um, native, indigenous, um, people of colors, um, to really change that, that perspective. You know, and there are a lot of people that were a part of this conversation it wasn't just me, there were other communities, other people from the community being, that, were, that are a part of this. So if we look at it as, you know, I'm an al I, I am an asset, you know, my work is an asset, then people begin to come to you and ask you for, for help. Um, 
so then you know there's there's that funding for production, but now we're moving to the second phase, which is post production, and this completely changes distribution, um, which is crowdfunding. And so that's something that we're doing right now. We're going through Kickstarter because we do have help from Sundance. I would, I would have rather gone with Indiegogo, but right now the networks are already in place for that. Um, we're done with production. We finished production October. Um, the people that are in the film, a lot of them are people that I know personally or people that I've met along the way or people who just showed up the day of the shoot. Um, other people have stepped out of place and other people have come in. And you know, I, rely, I definitely rely on the universe to make that happen within this work. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen with it. Um, we're gonna send it out to different film festivals, but right now I think a lot of people are just waiting to see what that project is gonna look like and what's, you know, what's the next step for that, so. Yeah. Michael, can you, um, talking about identity and, and community, you do a great series <clears throat> about uh, black businesses and, and really rooted in, in community and in black identity. Um, tell us a little bit about that and then tell us about how you strongly maintain your identity and how that's been a challenge based on how the system is sort of set up. Um, well, um, I started a project with a colleague of mine, uh, George from Four Seat Magazine, um, last year. It's called the Black Owned Business Series. And basically, what we were doing is finding um, black owned businesses locally and kind of just doing highlights on them, you know what I mean, in, in order to kind of just encourage people to, you know, give business to black, black business owners and to, you know, create group economics and, you know, kind of strengthen that in our community. And, um, you know, it's been a very uh, trying process. Um, and also a really good, great process because it's been giving me the chance to meet a lot of great people, you know what I mean, and a lot of um, great uh, community members. But also because it's like I'm coming, I'm doing this without funding, you know what I mean. And like a lot of these businesses are like people who I'm not necessarily trying to like approach them to like to pay for this, you know what I mean. I just want to give them business. So I mean that's definitely a um, a slight barrier. But but you know I'm passionate about the work, so it's it's not you know been that big of an issue. Um, but um, and what was the follow-up question? Just about your personal identity. Is this you know you present strong as a as a strong yeah. black man, and the, that's that's actually rare in, in the, the media. Well, world, I mean, I just you know? feel like it's important for me to like reflect the culture that I am that I am part of, you know what I mean? And for me to like you know always when you see me, I want you to know that I'm un unapologetically absolutely yes. black. You know what I mean? So it's like. Um, I mean, I just really for me, it's just you know, practice what you preach. You know I mean? Like if I'm out here, you know, trying to encourage other other you know people and to encourage people to tell different stories, and I want to definitely be you know representative of the stories that I'm trying to tell. So, um, and it's definitely I feel like it's important to um, to not so much focus on too many outside factors. You know what I mean? Like uh, like have, have letting other people like opinions have influence over you know. Over over me, like I, that's one thing I don't like to do. Is like, you know what I mean? Someone may have have, a, have an opinion about how I present myself or the work that I'm presenting, but at the end of the day, um, I I I am more concerned with like how my community personally feels about my work, and you know, if my how my mom will feel about my work, or like my elders will look at my work, right. and how they look at my me and how I present myself. So, how do you find your audience? How are you um, really, it's, it's been it's been word of mouth and just kind of like you know my community having my back, like you know like pe people when you create good work and you know people will see it and they'll they'll get it out there. So it's really been you know you know everybody who's, who's been supporting me you know, you know, and platforms like my guy George I was, I was mentioning his Four C magazine. Uh, he has a website where he posts like the video stuff that I do and then you know some blogs and stuff will pick things up you know. Right. So it's really just been like a community effort. I think that you, you'll find that that's a stronger resource in this new media world. Yeah. Um, these, the intersection of other independent media right. uh, and websites, and just that that share of community might even be worth more worthwhile going after than like mm -hmm. you know a brand or going after right. or than a, a larger distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, like I recently went through the, the situation with the fire where I lost my home and like you know. 
just to see the response from the community and you know them raising money to help me out and then I mean that just kind of was like something clicked. I was like, yo, you know, people are really here for me, you know what I mean? They have my back, you know what I mean? So if I can, you know, also tap into those resources when it comes to creating, you know, narratives, then I'm sure that people would still have my back in that regard also. So it's just a matter of like presenting, you know, ideas that are conscious to the community so they can appreciate, you know what I mean? Like, you know, that I'm trying to get their narratives out and, you know what I mean, expand. So. And this is open, everybody like chime in. If you have a question, yes. I kind of was wondering like from a story point of view, like how did you guys get started like as storytelling <coughs> through video? And what kind of resources would you kind of suggest for someone who's like kind of trying to branch into that a little bit? Can I point that at you, Rebecca, since you, you just been doing it? Your company is officially been around for a year, right? So you're like right at the, the point where you can maybe look back and reflect on how you started, what, what kind of tools you pulled together. <coughs> um, and like specifically websites yeah. or like resources that you found that first started I didn't even have a camera <laughs> I had a friend that, were, uh, that worked at the U and so he'd go and rent equipment for me and I would say oh I need a video camera next weekend like can I get you know what are your video cameras checked out and that's kind of how it started and then I slowly started to build you know having equipment so I got a, you know a Canon camera way back with some student loan money and so I've taken a very interesting route uh, the work that I've done has all been self-funded. I've never received a grant. I've never gone out and sought funding from any foundations. Uh, what I've done has been all like reinvesting into my company. And so now I have like a full production, you know, kit where I can go out and, you know, I have everything I need. But it was a really slow process. Are you using digital SLR? Yeah, so I have, yeah, like, um, like a Canon DSLR. And I have a couple of them, and you know I've worked with different cameras. But going back to your question about like websites, resources, um, it's all about networking. So really going for an opportunity that you may not feel like you're qualified for, and just saying, you know what, I'm going to learn it. I was working for a broadcast um, daily news TV show in New York, and I interviewed, and they said we're using this certain camera. And I was like, yep. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> and I went home the, that same night and I was watching YouTube videos, like, how do I work this camera? I called my friend, he has a camera. I was like, bring your camera over, we gotta like, teach me how to use it. So I think a lot of times, even as a woman, that you, may, you might feel like, I don't know how to do that. I don't have that experience. But it's scary sometimes when you just commit to something that you don't know or don't have. So it's been a, a process of figuring out, you know, am I going to take this commercial job to be able to pay for this passion project that I have? And that's what I've been able to do is balance. You know, I might in one day work and do a photo shoot for like Bissell Vacuums and then go and do a photo shoot, you know, for a community organization that needs headshots for their women in the shelter for getting jobs. So, I mean, the, the balance is really fine and I kind of go back and forth with figuring out what I'm comfortable with, and it's every single time figuring out, you know, do I take this job with Viacom? <laughs> and I ended up going for it and, and figuring out, you know, this is something that is challenging to try to tell revolutionary stories. I was a part of a production team for Rebel Music, which is a music documentary series on MTV. You can check it out on Netflix now, but I was a producer, and I came in it thinking that, yeah, I'm going to do something revolutionary, but trying to balance that within a corporate structure was really challenging. So, you know, all these different things, I don't know if I'm really answering your specific production type question, but there's, there's, it's going to be messy all the time, and you're never going to have that real great confidence, like, yes, I'm going to do this, and I know what I'm doing at all moments. You know, you're always going to question yourself, why do I do what I'm doing? I could go out and get a job at an ad agency and, you know, it would just be done. Like, be fresh productions, I'll just put that to sleep for a bit and get my paycheck. But, you know, it takes a lot of perseverance and um, <laughs> I'm looking at everybody that's on the panel, like, you know, this is something that we choose to do. And when I first got into it, it was because I couldn't get a job. So back in 2008, I, 2007, I graduated. 
and I was working in politics for a while at the Minnesota Women's Political Caucus. They lost their grant funding, and they were like, sorry, your job is gone. And I was like struggling, trying to find a job, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna take my hobby, my skill, photography, and just go with it. And so I started doing photography, and it branched into other things, but it was because I didn't really have a lot of other opportunities, but now I do it because I, I love it, and I know that I'm good at it. And I would say from a technical standpoint, yeah. I'm gonna say this, there is no hindrance from anyone doing whatever they want technically now. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. I start off in a world of film where it was like way <laughs> over there, beyond two gates, yeah. behind sharks and lions and a boat <laughs> and all that. And, and it was cost prohibitive and you couldn't really take a step <clears throat> into that. Now, you can make dynamic media with an iPad, with an iPhone. Yeah. Uh, Jeff has a program right now at the Uptake where they're doing professional uh, journalism on iPads. Uh, this, this is available to us right now, here and now. And I think the, the, the disconnect is we're, we all feel alone in that sort of getting started part to that. And that's, that's where the alliance part needs to really come together in that we can share resources, we can share um, information, we can share experience to get you to the point where you're not hung up on, uh, you know, I don't have a crew, uh, I don't even have anybody that can hold a mic for me, or I don't know what exact pieces to put together to do this. Um, there are steps within this room to get you there tomorrow. Uh, so St. Paul Neighborhood Network is a community media training facility. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the biggest thing, well, the first thing that I was told when I graduated from college, um, I was floor director for TPT. And I was super excited, and I remember the, the big homie Jim was like, so it's cool that you went to college, it's great, that gets you in the door, but we're gonna teach you what we do. Mm -hmm. And so I was super salty by that, because I just spent five years with all this money, mm -hmm. only to not use what I was learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, know that, like they were saying, as far as resources and tools, it's easily accessible, renting is awesome. But when you don't have the money, and you still want to produce something and get it out to the masses, you can reach out to your community's media facilities. That will give you a platform. So it's wonderful that you want to learn and everything, but community media also gives you a platform. So we teach After Effects, we teach Adobe, we even teach you how to use your iPad to do a movie, we even teach you how to use your cell phone to do a movie. <laughs> so spnn.org also will just answer questions, like people just call <laughs> and ask random questions, like I just got a call last night about I have this video that's on this website and I don't know how to get it off because I want to edit it. <laughs> and so I'm on Facebook, you know, driving and like talking. And I'm texting. I'm hitting the record button and saying, okay, use offliberty.com to get video off the website. Then, whether you have a PC or a Mac, bring it into your movie maker or bring it into iMovie. And there you can edit it. You know? So we're cool about answering questions and or teaching you basic structure as far as video production and doing interview and all that stuff. And you can broadcast it. <laughs> you can broadcast it. We have stuff on our YouTube channel. We have stuff on our channels. Um, so you'll, own, you'll also have a platform. So definitely the, the financial part of the resources is important. And that's why I brought it back to the phone that we all have in our pocket. Now, right. I really want us to get over this This sort of, that's something that somebody else does, right. and I don't have that power or ability within myself. Actually, everybody in this room does, right. could do exactly what we do. The and iPhone is a 4K, y'all, just saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think the money thing is huge for me, too, because I'm also, like, I make media, and um, I think I can relate with the, you know, college, uh, using my student loans to get it 
and my credit's messed up now, so they <laughs> help me out with you on afterwards. But welcome to the film. <laughs> <laughs>
just, just how you've established your relationships with potential clients, sort of the, the combination of the music you're doing, the design work you're doing with Anthony, just, just how it, it's, it's evolving into a business. All right, cool. So, um, how, when do we meet last? I think we've been dating for a little over a year now. Um, and right away, we really connected because we admire each other's like work ethic, and like we both were creators, and it just really was a passion was attractive to me. I don't know. And so, um, <laughs> and so we kind of saw what we did. He's attractive to me. We're all passionate. Right? <laughs> yeah, he's good looking as well, of course. <laughs> And so we really saw, like, I don't know, that's one of the first things I fell in love with was his work, his work ethic and just his creativity all around. And so kind of immediately, we thought, how could we make money together? <laughs> Even, like, in the start of our relationship. And so um, he's, he's a fashion designer, model, stylist, and all that. Um, and so we kind of just took our gifts, um, and he really pushed me to do my photography because I showed him, oh, here's some pictures. Or whatever. I'm originally like come, coming from a filmmaker uh, background, and I did photography just for the heck of it. And he was like, "What? Like these are dope? Like what? Do you, you don't take pictures? Like what?" And I'm like, eh, "You know." He was, and he set up a shoot, and he was like, "Let's let's get it popping. Let's do this." And then from then, um, we pushed into doing a little bit more like videography work with it. Mm -hmm. And so he like style the models, and um, like we'll pick like locations, do all that together. And then like one really cool thing that's happened um, with our photography work is we actually were like some models first like portfolio pictures that got them into their first like fashion shows and helped them in their career, like pushing them in that way. Um, as far as clientele personally, um, it's really a lot of word of mouth. Like people like will look for uh, on Facebook, hey, I need somebody to do this. And people will just tag me, uh, check her out, check her out, um, check her website. And um, it's all really in the community. Um, just people, very supportive people um, that know the struggle too. Trying to throw some money in projects my way. <laughs> um, and so it's just word of mouth, um, people recognizing um, the work and just trying to help push. Um, like I shot a lot of like events. I did my first wedding. Um, and then like people like see the clip from that and be like, oh my God, you're so cool. Can you do this for me? And then it just really just, literally just word of mouth. I just keep getting tagged on Facebook or getting calls like, oh, you, I saw you did my cousin's something, some video for something, and I really like it. I was wondering if we can do this. And yeah, it's been pretty smooth. Um, financially, it's been hell, but it all works out, especially if you do it you know, out of like your heart and you're real genuine with it. It's blessings will come flowing in regardless. So I try not to trip about money too much. I know it's going to work out, especially I got this guy on my side. So. <laughs> I, I think, you know, I, speaking of the people I know in the room, everyone that I know in the room has a unique story and perspective, and that's, that's what makes it powerful and valuable. Um, and I think, and, 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 that, and they're all um, either counter or alternative to what is in the traditional sort of money-making medium. And so I feel like there's a space in that to, to what Michael was talking about, to what <coughs> We were all talking about if if it is to make Twin Cities Media Alliance into that, then you know they need to hear that from you. If it's another sort of convening and a different iteration of that, uh, then we need to gather that together. I think again, we we, we, we must do that at least at the very least is is connected in that way that's that's uh, formal in order for it to work because. For too long, we've, we've existed all in our own yeah. sort of struggle in our own silos. And, and it's difficult to see, and it's difficult because you know, I, I know Destiny now, and I know her work. I know she has a unique perspective that, that is valuable, and, and she should be able to make a living off of that. Like the other, I don't know if you all have seen the Creative City, uh, Creative Index for the city of Minneapolis and the regions. Uh, basically, it puts our, our creative economy at number four or something in the nation. Mm -hmm. That means there are 30,000 people in this city making a living off their creativity. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's 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 a strong creative economy, and and you know we have a place in that in the vibrancy of this room. Yes. Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany. I'm a writer with Kansas City State Planet. I have writer's block though, I've been working at Kansas for a long time, and also with the planning committee for this forum. And I think you brought up a good point about uh, I think about equity. And so I hear a lot about you writing your own narratives, putting you know forth your own videos, your own photos, everything like that. But I think uh, just you know talk about how we change the game. So for you, you personally, what do you feel is a structural barrier, institutional barrier, and at the same time, uh, how do you feel in terms of putting your narrative out there? And then if it doesn't make any change, what do you think it does? I won't speak to that. So. My first piece as a producer at SPNN was feminism versus femininity in hip hop. So I just went in head first. I didn't even care. <laughs> um, I think the reason why is because I've been inspired by uh, Ava, um, who did Selma. Um, one of the biggest things that she says repeatedly is as a woman, as a woman of color, not waiting on someone to tell you um, when to do something or what to do. You need to just go out and do it. And so um, with St. Paul Neighborhood Network, it's a, a great avenue to just tell those stories. They value those stories. But I was really unapologetic, unafraid for that to be my first piece. And it was a, a discussion you know, with, um, two uh, female MCs, or no, one female MC, Maria Issa, and then uh, someone who was a promoter back in the day, Amber Ace Cleveland. Um, and so um, I felt like, in a way, I, I changed the game because no one else had brought up that narrative in hip hop, at least not here. Um, so I guess. It's just important to just go out and do it. If you have the tools, if you have the people around you who will support your work, um, it's a story, and you know that it's a story that hasn't been told and needs to be told. You just go and do it. If you have resources, go and do it. Yeah, I feel like it's 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 more of a matter of creating ripples that turn into waves. You know what I mean? So it's like you don't. You, I don't think you necessarily have to have validation from like a, a large scale or a large group of people. Like you don't have to. Get your get your 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 video on the news or on like a, a local network in order to to feel like you've made a difference. I mean, I feel like personally, when when people, my friends or people in my network, just tell me that they watch something and appreciate it, that's that's making a difference in my view. So I mean, in in terms of institutional barriers, I feel like you know, I, I mean, I personally haven't haven't watched the news or local news or TV, and I don't know how long. <coughs> then, you know, there's a reason for that. It's like I don't see anything on there that I can identify with or that I feel like it's of substance. So it's like, why is that happening? Like, why why aren't these stories that we've been creating being on, being put on this platform? So I feel like that's that's definitely a barrier. Um, but I feel like in this current climate, having access to like Vimeo, YouTube, and whatnot, that gives us the ability to to get our narratives out there to people, you know, all over the world. You know what I mean? So yeah, I don't think that. Uh, I mean, I feel like like hey, it would be dope to have have a platform. You know what I mean? That we get that we can broadcast to in our, our own like. You know, but I think that it's like, I don't know, it's, I, I think it's, there's more to it. Than, it's, it's more about, you know, the online aspect and the viral aspect than it is so much, you know, TV or what, you know, yeah. the box. And to, to your structural question, and actually connecting to what, um, what, what you both said, so Ava DuVernay, who, who directed Selma, also created, before Selma, she created our own distribution network. And it was based on her community. It was based on uh, folks that she knew was like her. They wanted, that were hungry for a certain kind of media that they weren't weren't being uh, given. And, and so uh, it was the building of the community was first, and then it was actually the, the connecting of it with some structure. And um, I think we could connect it to a structure of what we have here right now, which is we we have right now a strong pushback against traditional. What happened with Pointer Gate um, received a strong pushback. Um, the following of, of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement here locally has received strong support, and, and it's because it's, it's passionate. It's, it's about what people believe in. And I think the, the way to sort of structurally create around that 
is to structurally build around that movement. So everybody in this room is in here not because they're trying to get a job at the CBS, but because they're trying to tie the media that they're making to the audience that they're, they're talking to, whether it be social media or through the movement politics that they're involved in. Um, that, that's where the power lies, because people are already in that. They're already passionate about that. They're already passionate about, no, that's not going to be the story of every time I take a picture of somebody on point, I'm doing a gag stuff. That's, that's unacceptable. Um, so that, that's, to me, the, the foundation, foundational part of where we start building this network. It, it is around how each one of us is built individually as a, as a producer and creative is about what you're passionate about. It's about what you care about. Um, and I, I believe that there's enough here in locally, in our region and, and locally in the Twin Cities, there is enough caring, obviously. There's enough passion. There's enough strong um, inclination towards social justice. I still believe that, even though we have vast disparity that, that we need to deal with and sometimes we don't, we're not comfortable dealing with. Um, I still believe uh, that underneath there is a strong <coughs> passion for, for just. Um, yeah, I think your, your, your ability to push um, starts very close to you. So Adobe is, is the, the new publisher of, of this media organization, and she's right in the other room. So you can go up to her today and be like, look, I want you to tell this story this way, and, and this is how we're going to get it done. And I think she, she would be receptive to that. Um, and that's, I think that's, we can push larger sort of giant traditional uh, media by doing those like local connections and local uh, creation of story very well and doing them very authentically and doing them, um, again, from this perspective that they just don't see. It's, 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 it's largely invisible to them. So, we're not going to expect that they're ever going to get that without some push from an outside force. And again, that's why I refer to the like Black Lives Matter movement is they, they have moved the politics of the nation, the conversation of the nation, in a relatively short time just by organizing around some very strong, passionate principles. I mean, it, it, was, it was by the need and, and the, the, you know, abject, like, I can't breathe type outcry, but it, the effectiveness is, is not to be questioned. I mean, I, I, I can't think of another movement that's gained that kind of traction media-wise in, in that short amount of time. Um, and I think, obviously, it's because of circumstances, but the media component of that can't be uh, diminished. It's like even the media component of, of that lived experience that we've been talking about for a while. I've been talking about it for a while. I got harassed by the police a long time ago, you know, several times. So I've been saying this, but it hasn't been believable in the sense that it hasn't been filmed until, until recently. Mm -hmm. So that media has, has power to really push traditional merit, uh, narrative to a different place, no, whether they me. want to go there or not. Uh, I'm David Cattery. I'm a former NPR editor in the newspaper for 25, 30 years, uh, and I'm a journalist of color. And you will find good people at these traditional organizations, mm -hmm. including journalists of color who've been fighting these battles for four or five decades. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna find a lot of bad people. And those good people are outnumbered. And so there is an internal dynamic going on where people who look like me and like you are trying to tell the community story and your individual story, for example, in the right way, uh, but they're outnumbered and outdone. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in the chain of narrative town. But the, um, the, I don't think that there should be a disconnect between, say, independent minority media, the traditional black press, and what I call the establishment white media, which I've been a part of and have beat my head against the wall trying to change for a long time. Uh, and there are a lot of people doing that really good and necessary work. So just because you had a bad experience with those people, and some of whom are people of color, 
I had an editor, a black man from uh, New York once said, there's a danger in becoming the oppressor because you've got all these rules that you have to abide by. And, and you can fall into the trap. And I have, have made a couple of mistakes in my career earlier where I did some things in, that in retrospect I wish I hadn't done because I was following a, basically the white man's rule. You know, uh, and I learned from that. So uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, hate, I hate it when we get to the situation where all those people in that sector of media are evil and all of us are doing the right thing because sometimes all of us are doing the right thing. Uh, but uh, so I would keep trying. And there's a wonderful woman, Victoria Peterson, have you heard of her? She's a fusion, a black woman who is genius. Uh, who uh, writes code, uh, makes video, is a social media, uh, you should follow her on Twitter today. Uh, <laughs> and and, and she's, she's fighting your fight for you. She's, uh, she's in her early 30s and uh, uh, knows more about media than, and I'm a lot older than she is, than I'll ever know. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I would go to people like that who, and she's in, in the bridge between uh, independent media and she's an entrepreneur also, just uh, created websites uh, and traditional media. So, I mean, those, those, those barriers aren't set in stone. So we, we uh, are running out of time, I'm sorry. Can I add something yes, yes, really yes. quick to that, to what you're saying? Completely agree with you. I think it really comes down to ethics. It comes down to why you're doing media, what your ethics are. You know, for me, I relay back to my traditional values when I was taught growing up. That's a gift. That's really a blessing. That's something that my people were able to hold on to are those traditional teachings. The other thing, the second thing, FYI, we did not have access to our traditional traditional stories, our traditional teachings for a long period of time, for almost 100 years. We were prohibited by law from practicing any of our spiritual teachings as Native people until in 1978 with an amendment in 1994. So for me, my struggle is completely different. And it's not for me local, it's throughout the US, it's throughout Turtle Island, it's throughout South America, Canada, and also globally. And that's something that, you know, we have the power to do now. So there's, you know, my networks reach out beyond Minnesota. They're beyond, there's people who are doing work, commercial work, that have started with um, funding from tribes. Um, First Nations Experience, FNX, if you go up to Red Lake, they're on public television. They're moving like across the nation and it's all geared towards Native people, Native content, people who are out there doing that work. People are out there. I mean, the good people, like you say, the good people are out there. You just have to look beyond what's in front of you. Yeah. So uh, we do have to wrap. I'm going to encourage us all to continue to talk uh, to each other and amongst ourselves. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I don't know what time, what we're doing next. We have lunch, but thank you, panelists. Thank you for sharing your story. Appreciate you. Uh, like I said, we have lunch. We're still in the show. So take a look at that. Take a look at everybody's website. Um, a quick announcement: Everybody, please go to the theater first before we get lunch. That would be great. Thank you so much. All right.
both cultural and geographic communities, predominantly organizations led by uh, people of color, um, working on leveraging in place investments, um, also working on influencing the Metropolitan Council for the planning agencies, um, and some of their um, regional uh, and local level plans. So. Are we doing your panel? Is there a question? We, we can have Alondra talk about herself and then everyone, since this is just one group, and we can all kind of talk about why we're here. That would be, I think that sounds good. Hi, everybody. My name is Alondra Cano, and I'm a Ninth Ward Council member in the city of Minneapolis. And I'm excited to hear your thoughts and your questions on gentrification. Currently, uh, my office is working on identifying policies and um, initiatives that are uh, going to stop gentrification. <laughs> My name is Desmond Wan. Um, I work at the Davis Law Community Council, um, the community organizer. <coughs> also, I sit on the advisory board for the community organization there. Uh, I'm in the Davis Law. Um, I'm just here to kind of take in everything that everyone has to share and get their own experiences. I'm always looking at different pieces that will help me grow as an individual, but also better myself you know, within the community and you know, just kind of be a bearer of awareness. You know, so, uh, my name is Steve McClellan. Um, I have lived in South Minneapolis for 65 years in about 15 different locations. I presently work for a nonprofit dealing with developing musicians. I teach at Minneapolis College of Music. I bartend at the Schooner Tavern. I work cashier a couple of days a week to help foods. Um, and I wanted to find out what gentrification means. Uh, I'm talking about St. Paul, and I, do you want to close in the circle? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, my name is Carissa Jackson. Um, I am St. Paul resident. reluctant to use um, language of creative place making. Um, having just come back from the hand in glove where the creative place taking uh, is replacing that. Uh, so I am sad about that partly because I think there's a lot of usefulness uh, that, you know, what we just heard, artists have, there's a power in what we have to offer. So I, I'm just really trying to hold space for that in my institution and it has been working a little bit. There's a lot of good things happening that weren't happening just five years ago, just ten years ago. So, um, so I'm kind of here to listen, but also as a invested resident and community member. So a, a few uh, months ago, weeks ago, timing is um, hard to keep track of here. We had a, uh, a forum. Um, it was um, called Gentrification: Who Gets to Live in Minneapolis in 2020. And it really should have been perhaps called anti-gentrification, who gets to live <laughs> in the right. 2020, because I'm, I'm not taking a quote-unquote neutral position on this topic. I think gentrification is a bad thing for low-income communities and communities of color and for our city in general, especially as we're trying to address racial equity issues. And so um, to talk about it as a sort of um, a neutral process is, is not, um, according to me, uh, you know, correct. 
And so one of the panelists that joined us for that conversation, um, she's a, um, I guess, what is she, a fellow or a, like a visiting professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Chicano and Latino Studies. And she put together this um, two-pager on gentrification, sort of talking about what it is. And so I'll just pass it around, and, and you can kind of page through it as, as we're talking here. And there is no sort of silver bullet definition to gentrification in, in general. Uh, the way that, that I perceive gentrification is the displacement of communities of color, low income communities, disenfranchised communities um, in the city by uh, more powerful or wealthier uh, populations. And it's a, it's a process, so uh, usually it takes time to get to that uh, point where it's measurable and tangible and, and, um, and, and visible. Uh, but it's for sure happening in the city as we speak now. And from my perspective as a policymaker, I can just see the, the changes coming. I can see the trends starting to pick up. And you can start by looking at um, the transportation investments that have been made in this area that are now going to be coming to the, to the fore stronger. Uh, for example, we have the 35W and Lake Street Transit Access Station, which I've been told by people who are now 30-something, uh, was first discussed when they were in high school. And so this project has had many, many years of uh, consideration and discussion, and now we're seeing uh, the construction's going to begin. It'll begin in, within the next two to three years, and it'll be a, a multi-year project, but it'll be the most... Um, used uh, intersection and transit access station in the entire state. And so it's going to be moving a lot of people and it's going to have a lot of capacity to uh, bring people to the city and keep people out of the city. We also have the historic blue light investments, which um, are, you know, it's, it's the light rail that connects downtown to the Mall of America Airport. And now we're seeing development happening there on that corner. And we also know that the Midtown Greenway um, had a, res a study within the last two years, two to three years, that um, identified that corridor as a place for a light rail to happen. And so if you think about the city in 20 to 30 years from now, what that city looks like, and when you start to think about issues of sustainability and um, you know, gas prices and, and so forth, we know that there's now an interest uh, for people to move back into the urban core. Um, you know, Minneapolis used to be known as Murderopolis. Um, there was a lot of people who left Minneapolis um, in those years, and that's when the city created the, the Neighborhood Revitalization Program, the NRP program, which established the neighborhood, 71 neighborhood associations throughout the city, and started to help um, identify ways to um, reestablish the, the, the housing stock in Minneapolis, get people to reinvest in and really look at Minneapolis as a city that people wanted to live in again. And so that process has been playing out and now we're seeing that there is a demand uh, to live in the city today. You can see all the development that's happening in Uptown and that development is moving eastward um, towards um, our end of the, of the city. So with that, we're, we're seeing and hearing a lot of, um, uh, from a lot of renters who are being kicked out of their apartments because the apartments are now going to be remodeled or upgraded and the landlords are saying, well, you know, if you can afford to, to stay here once the, the apartment complex is, is remodeled, good for you, and if you can't, that's not my problem. So this is where we, we need to start thinking more about what is it that we're doing to support the vulnerable populations in our city who have invested in Minneapolis when nobody wanted to invest in Minneapolis. Uh, for example, Lake Street. Um, you know, the Latino and immigrant business owners on Lake and Bloomington will, will tell you that they invested in that part of the area when it was risky, meaning there was a lot of crime, there was a lot of challenges there, nobody saw that as a desirable part of the area to live in, and so these families and business owners came, these entrepreneurs started establishing their businesses, and now um, with the, the, con the subcontext of these transportation investments, this area is gonna look a lot different 20, years, 20 to 30 years from now if we don't do anything to uh, preserve that, that cultural um, uh, fabric that, that has been built over time. The other component that's moving right now is the reopening of um, Nicollet uh, at the Kmart site. So Nicollet and Lake Street will hopefully be reconnected. 
And that's a, that's a very direct way that the city is setting the stage for potential gentrification. And I've spoken about this on the city council and in our committee when we approved um, the city's acquisition of a few lots there to, to help with the reopening project. So um, just as we're being very intentional about ensuring that cars and communities can be connected and can have development opportunities, we have to be just as intentional to become the architects of racial equity, accessibility, accessibility and affordability in our city, and, um, and we need to do more work on that front. I don't think we as the, as the city council are doing enough um, brain work and, and physical work to develop policies that are gonna help um, mitigate the negative um, impacts of, of gentrification on our city's most vulnerable populations. And I wanna be clear that we don't confuse gentrification with mixed income. I think there's been this notion of, oh, well, no, gentrification is good because then we have integration of races and integration of you know, classes in terms of you know, wealthier and poorer communities. And, and that's, you know, building a, a mixed income community is different than, than gentrification. You can have a mixed income community without displacing and negatively impact, and impacting the folks who have been living in that neighborhood for a long time. And so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I have a couple of thoughts about the, the artists, the role of artists in, in this work because of the work that's happening on Chicago Avenue with the Pillsbury United Communities and Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association through the Bush Innovation Grant. And then um, we also have some renter's rights issues that are moving forward that, that I know folks will probably want to talk about a little bit. And then um, I actually have an article that, that talks about why it's bad for people of color to live together. And, and as reporters, I think it's important for, for us to understand that um, it's not problematic for people of color to live together. That's actually empowering. It's empowering for some people. It's empowering for me. I like it when my children can go uh, speak Spanish with their neighbors and, and see people from their cultural background and history. And, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I think we have to be really specific about addressing the root causes of what we understand to be structural racism, institutional racism, poverty, and not just that people living together is a problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. More thoughts to immediate thoughts and questions for all. You know, you mentioned how it's this you know, effort on by <clears throat> powerful people, right, to to change the dynamic, but it's it's not as easy as that. I mean, it's it's through more mundane actions, right, that we get. You know, the idea of remodeling a apartment building is very, in many ways, benign. It's a very benign thing to want to remodel an apartment building, and. You could argue it's very benign for the landlord to say, I have to raise rents in order to pay for that. So where does that, where do all of these individual, seemingly on their own, if I use that word again, benign actions, um, where is the, 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 the place where that can be uh, affected or, or even through policy change? I guess that's one thing I'm curious about. Well, I don't think it's benign when a family is given 30 days to, to leave their apartment, understanding that um, the um, vacancy rate in Minneapolis is very, very low, and it's very hard to find an apartment in Minneapolis, much less in 30 days, uh, much less with three children in the Minneapolis public school systems two months before the school is supposed to be uh, done. Uh, and so it, it's not benign when, when your livelihood is put on the line so quickly, and um, and somebody can sort of just flip it on you. You know, you go from one day from just being you, having your family, your home, your children going to school, you have your community, you know your neighbors, and then you get a notice in your mailbox saying, 30 days from now you need to leave, which is what happened to uh, a 12 um, unit apartment building in Corcoran, which were all Latino families. They were given 30 days to, to leave the building. <coughs> Otherwise, um, they, well yeah, they were just gonna be kicked out. And so we as a city, um, unfortunately that's a state law, the, the 30 day clause. And so we're, we're trying to figure out how the state can give people more time. Um, so that can be really unsettling for a family and it could actually turn families into homeless families in many instances, especially given that a lot of these families were undocumented, did not speak English very well, 
And so for families like that to find housing in Minneapolis, that's, that's a deep challenge. Um, so, so I guess I would just, yeah. I guess, I guess what, I, what I meant by matter. the, I guess what I meant by the word benign was do we question the landlord's intentions there with a growing city I finally maybe have the capital, I have the access to capital to do this. Yes, I'm, and then I follow the law, which is 30 days, and that's where the issue is, is, is raised. Is it, are we questioning the intention then of the landlords, or you know, is, it, is it as blatant as saying, I don't like Latino families living in my building anymore, so this is how I'm going to get them out. I mean, I, I don't know how yeah. blatant it is. I, you know, when we talk about a lot of these racial equity initiatives, particularly when you examine the work of um, Voices for Racial Justice, who used to be organizing apprenticeship project, they really made a, um, a clear division between intentions and outcomes. And so we're not here to decide who's got a good heart or a bad heart or who, who cares about people and who doesn't, but how do your actions uh, impact you know, a racial equity outcome? And if your actions are negatively impacting uh, racial equity outcomes, then that's where we have to challenge the action. And so in this case, it is problematic that renters, no matter what race, color, or creed you are, only have 30 days to, to find a new place knowing that in Minneapolis, it's very difficult right. to, to, to find any place because of the, um, the tight rental market. Um, so, so looking at more of the outcomes is important, ensuring that we're doing what we can to empower renters' rights in the city. So looking at just cause eviction and making sure that, um, you know, that if folks are gonna be quote unquote kicked out of their home, um, how do we make sure that it's for, extremely legitimate reasons and not just the whims of, um, of the market, per se. Because in this case, the market will always, um, you know, um, screw over the, the little guy. You know, the, the, the people who don't have enough money or don't you know, speak a specific language or, um, you know, who might have more mobility than others. And for some folks, this isn't a choice. You know, this is just the way that they survive and, and this is how they live. I um that I think uh, something I really like to talk about is um, the way that the media kind of contributes to um, the negative outcomes of um, gentrification, of displacement. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about in preparing for this and starting to kind of own about it is that I think a lot of the time the media talks about gentrification instead of talking about poverty. Mm -hmm. And that, um, both are seen as unavoidable and uh, something that we can't control. And that's untrue in both cases, that um, gentrification is complex, but there are things that we can do to avoid it, right? Um, and then poverty is something that we continually, continuously reinforce every day through policy, um, through everything. So I think um, I would like to see the media talk more about Poverty and stop normalizing poverty, um, and at the same then therefore stop normalizing gentrification and stop, um, you know, produce, reproducing and producing this idea that it's inevitable um, and that people should be poor because we could have good schools every in every neighborhood, we could have health, good health care for every person that is part of, lives in this country. We could have all those things. But instead, I think we can get caught up in talking about gentrification and then half the time we don't even all agree about what we're talking about and it's a, it's a distraction, mm -hmm. frankly, mm -hmm. a lot of the time it is. Mm -hmm. So that's something I was, have been thinking a lot about and I'm very curious to hear what other people think. Mm -hmm. um, if I could jump in on that. Please. I mean, on that point, I think part, you know, part of what This um, part of I think what you know the, the context, especially media context or narrative context around uh, gentrification and, and displacement as well. Um, part of it is it's, it's important to understand what what are some of the existing narratives in place as well. We talk about communities of color, um, low wealth communities in our region, um, and, and I pulled actually the, again the, to me the back and forth of this, and I have copies of it. I won't hand it out in a minute because it won't be in <laughs> in the weeds of it. But I can certainly like, print up copies of both the. Star Tribune was an editorial board piece, and then Neeraj, um, who's a colleague of mine, uh, as well, worked with uh, Kira and a lot of uh, his organization, a lot of things. Uh, 
connected to these issues. Um, but um, I'll just, I just have a couple of quotes from there that I think also help couch, again, how people are, how um, media is framing conversations about gentrification, but also just generally about communities of color. One of the things, one of the quotes there, um, talking again about North Minneapolis and how we you know, benefit from, from gentrification, says, um, you know, so, so it's initially going to start tribune article trying to push back on the idea that gentrification is sort of a real risk, right? I think that's one of the narratives that I hear a lot is this, this, this idea that people are, are overly concerned with it or it's not happening or it's not tan it's not quantifiable in a research or data sense, even though folks on the ground know it's happening, right? Mm -hmm. And folks on the ground understand the threat, um, especially people of color and renters, right? Um, so it says Minneapolis is far more threatened by growing concentrations of poverty and it then goes on to say something about sort of the north side of, of, of North Minneapolis um, sort of wobbles on a tipping point between sort of um, different poor communities on, on each side of it. Um, then it also says, um, very strangely, strange quote here, those with less tend to find ways to stay in neighborhoods that have more amenities. Clearly a mixed income community is preferable to one that slides towards the abyss of concentrated poverty, right? Um, to me, this narrative of concentrated poverty is part of the inherent problem in how we're talking about issues of gentrification and displacement and generally trying to address essentially the legacy of racism and disinvestment in communities of color and in our region. Um, I think that there is part of, there's, there's a whole, there's actually really good, I didn't print out copies of this, so, um, but there's a really good article in, um, in Slate that basically is, is titled, uh, the term progressives need to ditch if they want to seriously fight poverty. It's about this narrative of concentrated poverty. And it's basically sort of saying, the narrative of concentrated poverty places the blame and sort of pathologizes low-income, low-wealth communities of color, black and brown communities, instead of talking about, one, the history of, of the history and ongoing aspects of, of disinvestment, of displacement, right? I mean, there's, again, our, our region and our country is, is rich with, um, I mean, that in a bad way, is unfortunately rich with the legacy of, of building I-94 mm -hmm. right, right now, around the Avenue in St. Paul, mm -hmm. right? A, a community that despite in an era of really rampant racism, segregation, and disinvestment was yet <coughs> built to sell the black middle class, right? Um, despite all those challenges. I mean, that's the type of robbery of black wealth that's taking place in this country that is not contextualized to any degree in these conversations around gentrification, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there, so in other words, this narrative of concentrated poverty, you know, I see a person being deployed in places to either so cheerly gentrification. So in other words, saying, well, and that's to me, that's exactly what this, what this article was, what this um, uh, editorial board piece by the Strib was sort of saying, saying that it would be good for North Minneapolis to have wealthier, better off people. There was no conversation. This was where Amir's response was being grown. He performed the first things he named. He said, "This one of the things missing. You literally did not mention race in a conversation around gentrification, much less racism, much less even mention that, much less actually do the work to sort of." name and unpack how that's impacted urban land in our region and, and certainly in a community like North Minneapolis, right? Um, so I think those are pieces, again, that when, when, um, when media begins talking about them, and, and again, when, when, the, when we talk about addressing racial inequities in our region, um, talking about that, and, and we're starting from a place already a deficit-based around people of color, and we're already saying that there's a problem with, with a concentrated number of people of color, um, and, and we're sort of pathologizing spaces that are low income, low wealth, and majority people of color, then we're already not seeing the humanity of folks, right? We're already not seeing the humanity um, and not addressing, and not understanding the systemic and institutional layers to, to how our region has gotten the way it does, uh, it looks, excuse me. So, um, so anyways, I think those are some of the things, like I say, that to me in terms of the narrative around this stuff that is really, really, um, preventing us from having the different com different conversations that focus on again what are wealth building strategies, what are what is what could be sort of a um, you know again the degree to which <laughs> part of again the, I think the I, I implicate sort of all progressives in some ways in this is that um, we don't talk about we accept sort of the narrative around which communities have historically been subsidized and which right. have, which haven't been yeah. right or been disinvested from and I think that's something mm -hmm. right we talk about transit right as being a subsidy not acknowledging that every piece of transportation infrastructure in this country is heavily subsidized. Yeah. Right? And so suburban, wealthier, white suburban communities have been immensely invested and in, over-invested in subsidies, yeah. right? in a way that 
forces of communities of color, and even inner suburban communities of color have not been, right? Um, so there's many layers to this, I guess right. I'm sort of rambling here, but, um, but all this stuff I think is, is intertwined. I think this, we have to begin, I think that's, that's a lot of, one of the ways in which, um, like I said, I mentioned in the initials, I, I work with uh, a number of organizations on the head of coalition called Equity in Place, and that's one of the fundamental things that we have to pay so much attention to is to say, um, if we're not shifting the narrative, if we're not challenging these, these dominant narratives, and oftentimes, again, these are narratives wielded, these are not, so not Donald Trump talking about no. bills of contrary power. These are progressives, mm -hmm. right? These are these are liberals who are talking about this, right? This is the way a lot of institutions in our city, progressive-run, Democrat-run institutions, on the way. This is probably what's here. I'd be, I'd be careful um, how I name parties, but um, oh I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, so in other words, I, I guess I'm saying, right, that, that, that this is not this is not something that's being wielded by by out and out racists. Right? This is not this is not Donald Trump's saying. This is the problem. It's, it's, it's progressive, right? and, and it's so. How do we how do we sh change that narrative and and begin to have different conversations fundamentally about these issues? To me, that's 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 important. And the role of media is, is really key. Can I read an article that talks just about what you just said? Sure. So I was shocked when I read. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, let's see. This is a commentary piece that was written by Laurie Sturgeon for the Star Tribune, October twenty third, twenty fifteen. So it's like this big long article, um, but then I, we get to this part that, um, okay, so I'm just going to read you the, the paragraph, and then we can talk about the issues with the paragraph. So um, it's, it's talking about Jacob Fry's uh, stance and a couple issues, working families and some of this other stuff that the council was doing. So this one starts, that's not how the alderman who represents fast growing places like North Loop and Downtown East wants to exert the city's clout. Frey said he'd rather see city government work for more socio-economic and cultural integration of Minneapolis housing, working, and living patterns. More than half a century after racial segregation was outlawed, race-based enclaves remain in the state's largest city, contributing to persistent gaps between white and non-white populations in income, education, and well-being. Yeah. So it's blaming the the victims as opposed to just seeing that as a symptom of a root cause, right? Right, right. It's, it's just saying having so. too many brown people living together <laughs> yeah. contributes to these gaps yeah. between white and black. Right. And so it's, um, it's very problematic to, um, to make that assumption instead of talking about how um, the reasons we have these persistent gaps in income, education, and well-being is because when you look at the studies, people of color don't aren't giving as many opportunities to have jobs. Um, you know, it's because our schools aren't graduating our children at the same rates as, as white students. And um, you know, Neeraj isn't here, but if but if he was, he would probably talk about how it's easier to move people than it is to move resources. And so, why is it that only the resources only follow uh, the white folks and are never uh, funneled or targeted at uh, communities of color where we see the investment is needed. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was an example of how the media is not doing a good job of covering these issues. It's, right. it's really unfortunate to, to read that. <clears throat> I think another thing that um, I know is something that's kind of uh, gets talked about a lot in North Minneapolis, which is where I work, is um, I think I think there's a lot of historic trauma that we don't address either that we have to recognize we're dealing with when we're talking about gentrification because um, I think just like not being heard, not being blamed as a, as Alondra as Alondra just said is illustrating like people of color um, in some cases like communities that were like queer and get broken up, people get displaced, and um, it's just very real. It's just, you get a, like a trauma reaction to it. And um, I think it can keep people from being able to distinguish or even know the questions to ask is going to distinguish between development, gentrification, density, and investment. And most of the people that are, you know, <clears throat> want to be wary of gentrification, they also are, are 
want poverty to change, you know? But they're, we're not addressing the historic trauma, so we can't even have a really informed, nuanced conversation about what, where, there can be development that is led by people from an existing neighborhood. It, it can happen, it's possible. The media does not lift up those stories, or at least does not lift the complexity. Um, there, like more density in neighborhoods can be a way to preserve a, affordable housing that's affordable, just kind of naturally without being um, you know, technically subsidized. Um, there's all these things that we can do, but it's, we just have to recognize the trauma, I think, as a starting point. And that's what I've heard from a lot of people, but that's the sort of thing that also the media isn't really interested in touching because it's tricky. It's, yeah. I, I guess that you talking about that and you've kind of touched on it too, is that the history of disinvestment yeah. in communities of color um, forced folks who were middle class but were people of color out of those areas yeah. in many ways, but also it's like, there is still vibrant community there. Oh, yeah. And I, I, as a person of color who grew up in the area that was, um, you know, my parents bought a house right in some university and the uh, housing stock there has improved immensely. Their house is worth way more now than it was when they first purchased it. Um, and it's like, you know, when wealth is there, when, when folks are there, um, it's really important that the value of that is, is recognized because I think one of the things that I see besides the historical trauma is also just why is a community of color, a, a predominantly African American or predominantly Latino neighborhood not valued as something that's wonderful, right? Because you guys like to come here and you want to have a Mexican meal that night or when you want some soul food or yeah. you want to go and get jazzy with some nightlife but other than that it's sketchy and it's oh, I don't know I don't really want to I mean I was having a conversation with somebody who lived on the snowing and I was trying to convince them that that's the best place to live because <laughs> um, I love the Midway <laughs> but they were just kind of like I don't know I mean I've heard it's getting a little better but and it just really it shows me that like we really need to call people out on viewing like, communities of color and neighborhoods where they live as not valuable or not um, worth protecting. Mm -hmm. And because that's yeah. what it, it comes off. It's not worth it to protect mm -hmm. that fact, that that space mm -hmm. for those folks. Right. And that that's what the problem is to me because that's where the race racism comes into it where somehow it's less important for the fact that my family has been here for 30 years. That's less important than your need to renovate this apartment mm -hmm. or your need to do, you know, all of a sudden now you want to invest in this community because there's a train here, but I've been living here. Right? I've been here. <laughs> like that, that's that. Like we were here mm -hmm. and we were, you know, we kicked certain people out of the neighborhood. We moved crime out of our neighborhoods and we worked for that. Yeah. We worked to get it to this place and now you want to take it away from us. Mm -hmm. um, that feeling is so visceral <laughs> and it's the conversation that I was a part of and heard during Greenline and so now that we're having more of the investment and shifting happening in, in our inner city, it's like, I really want to hear that in the media is that like, mm -hmm. these are important communities to protect. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you have a sense of how much of this, uh, whether it's the media coverage or even the public perception, because we should know, because people probably read that strip up at, and oh, yeah. Yeah. said right on, yeah. how much of it is actually not at all thoughtful, is in fact quite a very simple place to go in your head, this is me asking through my white lens, of, of the, the coat of paint kind of thing. Of I know of this community where the housing stock is older 
uh, and frankly, it's just ugly to drive down because too many houses have been painted, or frankly, because of the foreclosure crisis, right? We have houses that are not occupied, and so I don't, I don't think about your family who's been there for 30 years and think about the vibrancy of that community. I just think about what I see with my own eyes as, well, clearly gentrification will rebuild those houses and the coats of paint and the, the, the decoration, the, the landscaping will improve. And, and I just wonder how many people just stop right there. And if that's what we're, we're thinking about. And maybe I'm totally off here. I, well, you, you said clearly gentrification would do that, well, and not clearly investment or well, but that's right. No, but that's that's right. That's the perspective I'm right. Bring, I'm asking about because but again, for the people who read that article and said yes, you know, I'm trying to understand where they're coming from, but also where the conversation then engages them. And to what you just said, that's one of the places. It's, it's not the coat of paint that the next person who owns this <laughs> land. Puts on it's the investment in the community now. Right. You know, that, that's, I, I, I don't know to what extent what I just said is is part of the thing. I think there's some assumptions there that you know that you that you recognize, but that the assumption that um, that yeah that it has to for things to improve they have to be whitewashed. You know that it has to be <coughs> well like external wealthy probably white people coming in and also that um, it's impossible to improve people's uh, life conditions to, to do anything about the existing poverty that makes it hard to repaint your house or own a house um, so it's like why couldn't we just envision lifting up those people's like removing the barriers to employment and um, all education and all all of that, like that, there's more than one way to get a, a coat of paint on right. those houses, and so, but the, you, I think you're, you're honest, and like the assumption is that gentrification is going to come and fix that, but it doesn't have to be <coughs> external, and it doesn't have to be whitewashed. Well, and, and again, I think I think some of it is is right. There's there's these unacknowledged both both internalized narratives about communities of color. Everybody has, right? Um, but, but then there's also these. Um, on top of that, there's like I say, there's, there's not. We don't have. We not. We don't have conversations in our, in our, in certainly mainstream media dialogue around that really acknowledge um, that acknowledge and articulate an understanding for how institutional racism works. Now, racism works. Let's be on all levels, right? From from um, systems down to the interpersonal, down to the internal. And I think that's part of what I see at play, right, is, is, that, is that you have people able to drive through a, a neighborhood like, like, like Rondo or Broadtowns or Midway and sort of not see, not see that, not have any understanding of the history of what's, what's taking place in that neighborhood, right? Not have any understanding for um, the difference in access that folks, that folks there have, um, folks of color there have relative to white people who grow up in other neighborhoods, or even for that matter, grow up there um, at times, right? So, so it's these, these different, um, I think that's, that's <coughs> part of the, the uh, and again, on the flip side, I think it's again, and how, how um, at a, in a personal level, how internalized these narratives, these deficit-based narratives about communities of color, again, there's not acknowledgement, right? This country invested in wealth-building strategies through home ownership for, for to create the sort of middle class of America, yeah. right? Um, through home ownership, through the transportation system, freeways, et cetera, right? Um, education, public education, um, right? In a way that that never extended to the same breadth in terms of communities of color. <coughs> uh, our certain new Americans in this country have also have not been recipients of, of those benefits. So um, African American, indigenous populations have been um, no immigrants. So again, so how like? I think that's some of when we talk about sort of solutions and we talk about what are what is the what are some of the policy ways that we can be thinking about this. In my mind, there has to be there has to be thinking about what are the really clear intentional ways to to invest in building wealth, building a middle class, um, building home ownership opportunities, building small business opportunities 
in communities of color. And I think there has to be, um, you know, a, a, a multiple layers of policy, um, as well as obviously, again, that's also the, what's important with narratives, right, is to get people to think differently, is to get different, to have these conversations. There is no conversation, there's lots of conversations around, <coughs> around where affordable housing <coughs> should be built in our region, right, around deconcentrated poverty. There's no conversation, right, around what, what would sustained investment in places where people in geographies and specifically for residents of color in those geographies, what would that look like, right? And, and how does that also benefit folks? How does that benefit our region? How does yeah. that benefit folks even outside of those geographies, right? In terms of, so I think that's also, again, part of what is on us, but also on, on, on media as well as, as beginning to um, change some of what's possible, right? Change the conversation about what is possible, and what would solutions actually be, so. I think it's metaphorical maybe a little more, but I keep thinking about Ms. Fred Rogers um, in the goes around when there's a crisis like happened last night. Um, look for the helpers. And that is something media could do. They could raise the stories of what's working and the good work that people maybe around the circle are doing and um, do the opposite of vilify poverty rather make heroic just humanism mm -hmm. just just being good people towards each other um, and that I mean that a little bit pulls a, a, away from the race conversation in the second but that is something that the press could do the professional educators at the same time I have this real hope or desire for everybody to get worldview training to really get um, into empathy mode. Like that should just be required Minneapolis public school <laughs> curriculum. Um, and part, part of that is coming out of just the work I've, I've personally done, not my professional work, but I'm seeing opportunities where one could insert that kind of thinking into everything we do. Um, and then I just would point to the, the Science Museum's ex exhibition in back that was up in 2007 on race, and it very specifically illuminated the 1950s or the, the middle class generation and the, the complete cut out of different race than the people that were making those rules. Which, which one? Um, yes. Suburbia. Um, Multiple, there, so it was such a thick exhibit, I had an hour to go through it. Where is it? It's at the Science Museum of Minnesota, okay. and I, I very much recommend it, and I, I also wonder, again, it could be required, <laughs> but I sat next to somebody who um, was speaking of being a homeowner, um, and having to, in order to sell his house, he put it up, he got an appraisal, and it was like $10,000 less, it was, I think he was in Atlanta, than he, um, it should have been. Um, he got a new appraiser and took off pictures of his fans out of uh, out of the house, and it upped the the value. Yeah. It was and the, so wait, it wasn't the guy next to me. It was the guy in front of me because it was a little screen that we sat on the stoop and watched a uh, newspaper box together. And he said, "Yep, I've had to do that." The guy next to me, and I just thought, I again that empathy. I am not somebody that actively has a racist agenda, but I didn't know that, so you don't know what you don't know. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that professional level of it, but also very aware that I have to take personal responsibility for learning the, learning what I don't know. <laughs> and I don't know what that is in this conversation, except for potentially those really individualized stories of helpers and really, you know, making heroic, just, just being good community members could be helpful, along with policy making that, <laughs> that just digs in and lets us be good people to support it. <laughs> just listening to everyone here, um, you know, listening to everyone's ideas, thoughts, you know, and basically the way I look at it is we're all talking about what we all want. Talking about healing. How do you heal a nation? How do you heal several nations in one community? 
how do you do that? How do you empower those community members that from day one were some way, somehow always given messages that they were powerless, that they were only supposed to stay in one area, that you know, they were only limited with so many options. You know, how do you tell a community, a family, an individual that all that was a lie? How do you under, how, how do you tell them, you know, that they had the power all the time? And one thing to do, you know, my big thing is to re-educate, to inform, to increase their awareness. Not only in my own community, but I mean also in other communities, also in the dominant society that we're talking about. That makes those rules, that makes those regulations, that makes those ideas and those concepts that we buy into, that, that Kool-Aid that we drink every day. How do we, you know, tell our loved ones, our community members, that you know they had a place, it, it's already there, that this was a sham, you know? And slowly but surely, we talk about media because media, period, is the number one thing of misconceptions, of you know stereotypes, of labels. experiences, you know, that we went through, you know, but unfortunately, the, the stains that we carry, that, you know, the stains that our grandparents, our other relatives carry, it does trickle down. That's the thing of historical trauma. And when I visualize historical trauma, and a generational trauma, too, is another label, you can call it, I look at it as a sieve as far as just, you know, all the time, just pressure, pressure, pressure. And you have the liquid, but then you have the residue, you know, and it starts off clear, but it gets thicker and thicker and darker and heavier. Now, if you look, if you just take that picture and apply it to intergenerational trauma where our great-great-grandparents on down, you know, started <coughs> in this liquid and our kids, our grandkids are in this mom, heaven. You know, certain things are not made aware, you know, that you do have the power. You can change your stars. You know, you, you are built with, you know, certain parameters, but at the same time, ones like us, we have the power to show other options. And I'm very big on options. You know, my, my thing, my, my background, um, before I became a community organizer, was education. Uh, working with, um, you know, kids of color, but also at risk and you know, special needs, um, and also working with the animals. You know, and being that mediator between you know, that dominant society where they wanted to just you know, tell you what to do and how to go about it and have no accountability. But also when we talk about healing in our own community, you know, those entities that, those dominant entities that we interact with, they need to heal as well. They need to really understand, like, you know, the percentages of, of, of numbness or desensitized feelings they get. You know, because again, you know, some of these entities that we come in contact with every day as a community member, you know, 
those entities go from one extreme to the other, from very simple, non-stressful extremes to very dramatic extremes, you know, and even our community members at times are facing that, you know, and how can you rationally make a decision, <coughs> make a decision or react in a way that's positive and healthy when you don't have those skills, you don't have those tools on you, you know, it's like a carpenter that has his weight belt and has all his tools in there. You know, when you first start out on a job, your tool belt is not that packed. You know, you build those skills. You know, and some of us really haven't had the time to collect those tools. We're just told, go fix that, go build that, go complete it. But we're never given a schematic, we're never built, you know, we're never told what our tools are actually for. You know, we, you know, we may have a hammer or a saw or whatever, but we don't know how to use it. We're just expect it, how to use it, because the dominant society and their children have always been told, have always been shown. So how can a community that really wasn't exposed to those experiences influentially and positively show those younger generations? How can they? That's like asking a blind person, what color do you like best? You like blue or red? But then never really understanding what color it is. You know, never ever having sight. You know, that's, I feel that's kind of the stepping stones is, you know, letting our community members, our, our, our family members know that, you know, there is a switch over there. You know, you have your power to turn it on anytime you want. You know, that we don't have this in there. That we have our own power. You know, and once we buy into that concept, that healing will start. Then, because then we talk about chances. Then we're talking about people taking those opportunities <coughs> or those steps that we want to see in our community. But in order for having It has to start, you know, somewhere, you know, and going out here, you know, it's, it's, it's very long, it's not easy, and, you know, but at the same time, we're talking about a concept that's really hard to understand in a society that's filled with instant gratification, you know, everything's instant nowadays, you know, text, email, calls, everything's instant, you know, we can't even wonder why someone, you know, I have a Google, Google something. You know, let's Google. <laughs> we, we can't sit and have a conversation with me. You know, um, so it's that thought that, you know, we live in a dominant society that's always moving. But we're talking about concepts that's very social. But how do we find this? How do we build in that into a society that's always moving, you know, seems like never sleeping? <laughs> you know, and that's just kind of my thoughts from listening, but also kind of marinating on some of the events and some of the things I've been exposed to, not only in my community, but where I've seen other communities. Thanks, uh, Thanks for that. Um, we're going to be having to wrap up soon, so I just wanted to give us a to do some I guess I was facetious when I said I wanted to know about gentrification. The only reason I'm not bringing it up is it's all selfish, personal experience. And we've touched on, to me it's much simpler than this whole discussion. And I don't look at the Tribune to tell me when I have to move out of my neighborhood because I can't afford it. Where do I go to? And I do understand the ratio. When I was in kindergarten, we had a home on 2nd Avenue South. It was two blocks from then Nicollet Park, which is now Martin Luther King Park. And when we had to move, I was five years old, I didn't know why, but it was long years later that I found out, yep, 35, that's to keep the black population on this side and not get them to move any further west. Kind of like the 94, I'm not a St. Paul resident, but everything I hear about what 94 did in the Rondo neighborhood. Um, I, I look at it, you know, 
I, I never made monetary much, so I always knew before the Tribune printed when I had to leave my neighborhood because I couldn't afford to live there anymore. I went to the Ulisaw High School from 64 to 68. You could get a room in a flop house back to the USL in 64 for very reasonable rates. Now they're unaffordable condominiums that you can't own, except for the city has taken over all control of Nicholas Island now. You can only buy a lease for 99 years, I guess, but only the wealthy yes. are on Nicollet Island. I lived in a, uh, Harmon Apartments early on in downtown, Tenth and Harmon. If you could put up with the cockroaches, it was a very reasonable rent for living on 10th, 10th Street, downtown Minneapolis. I loved it. Well, of course, when they tore that down to put up whatever that <coughs> school is that went up, I had to move. Um, I lived over on the West Bank University in a house that is now the University of Minnesota New Law School. All those houses are gone. I paid $35 a month rent when I went to the University of Minnesota just because I just needed a room. So gentrification is always, you know, I, I think Occupy movement has the best. It's always been economic to me. Yeah. The, the talk of racial minorities, uh, my attitude was when I went into a new neighborhood, I said, oh, I'm living with a bunch of people that can't afford the neighborhood I just got kicked out of. Um, in fact, right now, I just got my, I own two houses. One I lost on Lindale because of divorce, and it was the worst time to sell. So we sold it for less than we bought it, and I ended up taking the hit on that. I just moved from the uh, elite East Seward neighborhood because my house was foreclosed because I couldn't afford the expenses, the taxes, and I finally I'd lost a full time job and I was working part time, and I just so I let the banks foreclosed on it. So now I'm on the very poor east or west side of Seward. I, I'm almost if I step three steps up my back door, I'm in the Phillips neighborhood. I'm right, right on the high wall thing. thing. And I just heard now I went to one of the Seward neighborhood meetings. They're putting in some new, brand new luxury <coughs> apartments. Two blocks from, I'm on two blocks from the Cedar Franklin neighborhood, and they're tearing up that whole area. <coughs> so I always know when I'm about ready to move because I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be able to afford where I'm at when all these new high rises go up. And I've never put it as complicated as this discussion is. I just, oh, I guess I got to move down. Or win the lottery or something. Yeah. So I've always looked at it, and then, like I said, I, I did go to a few of the Occupy movements trying to keep the banks from taking back the houses of people that have lived them for 40 years. And to me, the problem has always been money dictates. You know, I look at the new Viking Stadium will probably end any kind of affordable housing on the north side of 94. There was a few houses in there that still had afforded in the Elliott neighborhood by the little band box. I think there was still some affordable housing there. There's still, I would argue there's still. And you don't think the Viking Stadium's going to push oh, that? Oh, I don't know, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Well, the reason I moved out of there. I would challenge what you're saying that it's a simple, because that's what you're talking about is not really simple. It's a simple No, thing no, no. When you from exactly a, I said this is a very selfish standpoint on my behalf. No, I'm just saying this goes to what you were talking about that it's not a thing that has to happen every time someone makes an investment in your community, you don't have to have to have moved. And that's the problem with this idea of gentrification as some normal thing that's supposed to happen. Why should I, who made the decision to live in a neighborhood and live there, have to move because you decided that this is now an attractive place to you? That is the history of America. Is, oh, that looks really nice. Would you yeah. want there? I'm going to take it take it. I mean, just from the point that we First started, we all know that's where we started. Well, Unfortunately, there is so it's not okay to in a new. I, I'm going to use the West Bank as an example. Back when there was that rooming house where Grandma's used to be, which is now new. Back when the 10th Avenue Bridge, and I was living, it was a very artist, it was cheap. There was a lot of artists on in there. Now you go over there, you don't want to live in that neighborhood. It's, it's not all the places are too expensive to eat. They, they, they used to be the little band box you got five dollars for a dollar. Uh, no, I'm talking seven corners now. It's not oh. the same neighborhood it was. The people I associated with all moved out. You know, they talk about the art scene and how art scenes come in and take private neighborhoods, and then all of a sudden they all have to get kicked out after they made it better to live in. 
Well, a perfect example of that is um, um, the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I used to go to New York every year for music events. And I used to, in the early 80s, you didn't walk in Block C or Avenue C or A or B because it was a heroin addict. You have to, it was, a, you know, people were warning, don't go over in that neighborhood. But that's where all the after, club, after hours clubs were. That's where all the people I knew were going in after hours. And yet, now I went, uh, it was actually, I don't know, 90, well, it was actually 9 11 year, 90, that I went back there and it's all now upgraded. All of the people, the artists and stuff have moved over to Brooklyn. The people that developed the neighborhood, and somewhat I always look at the Twin City Media Line, it's more arts oriented. And, and since I worked in music all the time, I can I say. Can I, I just, I, I know we're out of Oh, yeah. I just want to ask one more quick, just one more. Yeah. I, I, to what you're saying and what you're, I, I, it just makes me wonder if part of the challenge here is, so for example, when we talk about race or poverty, these are challenging conversations, we don't have all the answers, but I, I think we start all of those conversations from a pretty universal standpoint of, we all agree racism is bad or that poverty is bad. Most of us do, right? And then we start the conversation from there and then it's a hard conversation and we don't know what the answer is. Oh, no, we're not there yet. We don't have that. Is gentrification bad? That's not a universally answered question. I, mean, I don't know if that's what you would, or you would, if that's even part of the challenge here. I mean, I'm shocked that people would perceive gentrification as a positive yeah. thing. I, my entire life, I have known gentrification as a negative thing. So I'm really confused when somebody says that gentrification is a good thing. That's weird. I, I don't even understand, understand that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, like wow, we're going to grow up. But it is. People say that. Is it? I don't know. I think it's like global warming. Huh? <laughs> it's like denying that global warming exists. It has a similar not enough information yeah. for those that say it's po could be positive. Or maybe people don't understand what gentrification means, or maybe there's not a common definition, mm -hmm. a widely understood definition. And if we could all agree to a definition, then we can start saying, yes, we think it's bad, or no, we don't think it's bad. I think every time the media talks about gentrification, we should be forced to, disc to define what they mean. Yeah, like which like, rule definition are you using? Yeah. <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> which one are you using? Because well, they make it synonymous with like improvement. Yes, exactly. That's, so that's why gentrification is not just improvement yes. of a neighborhood. Yeah, it's all about oh, well, that's what there's an investment in business, and we're we're the housing buyer The you're housing stock is yeah. improving, and it's like. That's not what gentrification is about, what you described. Every time you guys decide to make an investment here, I have to I have move. To go, right. yeah. And that's that is a problem. Is. And nobody can tell me that that's a good that's thing. That's never that's said. Yes, it's improving the neighborhood, but what they don't say in parentheses, if you can afford it. Right. Or, yeah, and that has to do with the restaurants you eat at, the grocery stores you go to. Yeah. And, that's why there's all these in my neighborhood and no lungs. Because all these is cheaper, and I prefer all these in lots, because I can afford all these. I mean, there's, there's one other thought on this. I mean, this is, again, the importance of, of the media's role, I think, in this as well, um, and all of our collective role as well, is, is, right? I mean, that's part of the problem is, again, who you're, who, who is, whose story is being represented in that process, right? So, so if people drive through the neighborhood and aren't from there and see, like, oh, yeah, some of the businesses are coming through, the narrative they like is the neighborhood's improved, right? But if, and this is, again, this is, again, the way in which I think we, we don't allow expertise or who's experts, right? If I see one more article that, that reaches out to academics of you, that talks to Myron Warfield and gets yeah, yeah. these folks right, like, like and, and I'm not saying I, dis, I disagree with everything they've written, not I, I personally, I, I work with Kira, so I, I like it. But I think he's done actually a good job of stepping back and acknowledging, no, we actually need a different set of folks to be viewed as experts than the guys who work with you and, and don't live in those levels, right? And, and aren't from those cultural communities. So I think that's part of it as well, is, is how do we actually get stories from folks? When, when, when the strip is writing an article, or, or Mint Post, or NPR, even, you know, different, different entities are writing articles, how are you actually getting folks who are actually also experts in the experience, or experts in the issue of housing, because they're living, right? As right. opposed to folks who've, who've had the privilege of being able to research this for 20, 30, 40 yeah, years. Yeah, the problem, yeah. So I think that's just a, a final thought about this stuff. So. Something that I would have liked to talk about is, because um, we talked about this, but um, uh, culture and aesthetics and like what 
I think a lot of times gentrification is, a vis is something that we see visually, and that's why I think some people think of it as a positive thing, people like that don't, don't have a social justice lens or an anti-racist framework. But um, um, one, so in, it's really important to my work in North Minneapolis to that any of the improvements we're making to, you know, we dis we disperse facade improvement funds, mur we um, we fund murals, and we're, we put up street banners and holiday decorations, and we're going to be doing all these other physical improvements to the the experience of the primary commercial corridor of North Minneapolis is that the aesthetic has it has to be the aesthetic of the existing community. We're not trying to roll out and say, just make everything look cleaner and nicer so that it's more attractive to outsiders or it's it's about color too. It's about what what does the existing community, the people that feel ownership on a very deep level to this place, like how are they reflected in the aesthetics of the improvements? And I mean, the way that we do that is those people are the ones making the <coughs> Those artists are the ones in charge of making those, those improvements and expressing the aesthetics and the art that speaks to the cultures of the existing people. Um, Mentioned like driving through communities. I feel like Minneapolis is so segregated. Maybe it's for people that I know, but I don't think people do even drive through. Like a lot of people I know won't even go to West Broadway right. or um, Metro Frogtown or things like that. So, can arts events bring people? Is that a good thing for people to come in and see what's already going on in the neighborhood, or is that kind of like the beginnings of gentrification? Like, oh, maybe I'll like head to that neighborhood and that'll become the new trendy place and we'll push out the people who are already there. Like. I guess striking the balance of making it a cool place currently <coughs> without that turning into right. like the trendy gentrification. I think it's it can be done. I think it's something to keep in mind, but it's we also have to try. But I think it has to be like the way we do it is like you're invited as an outsider to join us, to join the community. You're not invited, you're not the soul. Like the outside when we do like low or side ice crawl. The external audience is the secondary audience, you know, and then then you get kind of a self-selecting, more friendly um, audience coming from inside. It's like you know this isn't about you. This is if you want to come and like observe and take part, that's fine. But don't expect to be catered to because you're because you're visitors. <clears throat>